Look with me, please, to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Now remember, Son of Man is the eschatological title of Jesus. The Scripture never speaks of Him as Son of God coming to earth. He's the Son of God in heaven. When the Scripture speaks of Him coming to earth, it says Son of Man. All of Israel's prophets are types or pictures of Jesus in some way. Ezekiel is the only one other than Jesus called Son of Man. He's a picture of Jesus eschatologically. He's a picture of Jesus in the last days. There is one person in the book of Daniel not identified walking in the oven with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that we know to be a Christophany that is Jesus walking with them in the oven. But Ezekiel is a picture of Jesus eschatologically. The book of Revelation, every chapter of Revelation except one, quotes from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is quoted more in the context of the message of Jesus for the last days than any other prophet. Ezekiel is called Son of Man, when Son of Man comes. And he says, prophesy against the shepherds. I've explained many times that the term shepherd is the same word for Hebrew in both Greek and in Hebrew. It's the same word for pastor. In Hebrew, it is ro'e, ro'e, like Adonai ro'e, the Lord is my shepherd. In Greek, it is either poeon or episkopo. We get the word episkopo. Epi, around, scopo, looking over, over the flock. Prophesy against the pastors and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat, clothe yourself with the wool, you slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you've not strengthened, the disease you've not healed, the broken you have not bound up, the scattered you've not brought back, nor have you sought for the loss, but with force and severity, You have dominated them, and they were scattered for lack of a shepherd, and they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. My flock wandered through all the mountains on every high hill. My flock was scattered over all the surface of the earth, and there was no one to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord, surely because my flock has become a prey. My flock even became food for all the beasts of the field for lack of a shepherd, for lack of a pastor. My shepherds did not search for my flock, but rather the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed the flock. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against the shepherds. I am against the pastors. And I shall demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding sheep so the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore. But I shall deliver my flock from their mouth that they may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out as a shepherd cares for his herd in the day. When he's among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. And then he goes on. He also says a time would come when he would raise up shepherds after his own heart, etc. Ezekiel and Jeremiah are both very concerned about the shepherds, as was Jesus in John chapter 10. When the shepherds feed themselves, they were scattered, they didn't care about them. When they were hurting, they didn't care about them. The lost, they didn't care about them. The ministry was a livelihood, what Jesus would call a hireling. It was about numbers. It was about income. That's what the flock was to them. The shepherd was not there for the sheep. The sheep was there 
for the shepherds. And Jesus said, or the, the Lord said to Ezekiel, with force and severity, you have dominated them. Let's talk about this subject of the shepherds who dominate with force and severity. It is a very big problem, but it is a problem that has become steadily worse in the last 15 years. And it's getting worse as we speak. It is normally called heavy shepherding. What is on back of heavy shepherding? Jesus hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Many of you have heard me point this out. There are different theories as to who they were. They were followers of somebody called Nicklaus. Some traditions identify him as one of the deacons who went off from Acts 6, but nobody knows. We only know what Nicolaitanism means. Nicol, suppression of the laity, people. A clergy class who sets itself above the people. And we know that Jesus hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Look at how it evolved in the early church and what it became. First it went to monoepiscopacy. Then it went to, ultimately, primacy, and then a monarchical papacy, the Pope, saying that he's the Holy Father. <sighs> he's the teacher. He's the vicar of Christ. Another Christ. Unbelievable. But it begins in Israel. Moses was the most humble man in Israel. So many of the people God raised up, David, Amos, Moses, they were shepherds. They knew how to care for sheep. Let's look at this. With force and severity, you've dominated them. Understand what is happening. What is being called church growth today, what is on back of purpose-driven, seeker-sensitive, seeker-friendly, this is based on marketing. It's based on marketing psychology. It is based on consumerism. Whenever we use a secular discipline, something from the secular world in God's work, it must be firmly, firmly subordinated to the principles of Scripture. Once it is not being subordinated to the principles of Scripture it will usurp the authority of Scripture. Let's just look at what is happening as we speak. I've explained how John chapter 1, and archaic kai ho logos, in the beginning was the word. Verse 14, the logos became sarx, the word became flesh. And kataskeno among us. That word kataskeno is a Greekization of Shekinah, Shekinah among us. The same God who was in the Shekinah would become flesh in the person of the Messiah, and it would be the Word of God made flesh. That's what it was saying. The same God who was in the Shekinah glory would become human. Jesus is the Scripture incarnate. The Scripture is Jesus in print. That's the meaning of John 1.14. In Eugene Peterson's The Message, it says, the word became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. Now understand, that is not the word of God. That bears no resemblance to the word of God. It has nothing to do with what the Holy Spirit breathed in John 1.14. That's the message. What is Eugene Peterson's Promoter, who uses the message? Rick Warren. You get another Bible that's not the Bible. Because the Bible does not teach what Rick Warren teaches. He did not get it from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. He got it from somebody now dead, an unsaved Jewish marketing guru called Peter Drucker, who died unsaved as far as anybody knows. You do market research, find out what people want, then you do it. Rick Warren and Bill Hybels were not the first ones to attempt this, however. 
The first one who actually did this was somebody called Robert Schuller. And he built an amazing church near Los Angeles called the Crystal Cathedral based on marketing. Find out what people want and give it to them. You can get the numbers. You can get the money. You can get a huge building. And they call the building a house for the Lord, but actually it's a monument to a man. The church is never a building. It's the people in it. Unless the Lord builds a house, it cannot stand. It can build it, but it can't stand. Well, Mr. Schuler inspired another generation of people. But he was inspired by a 33rd degree Freemason called Norman Vincent Peale from Marble Collegiate Church in my native New York who combined psychology with a liberal interpretation of Protestantism. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale was the mentor of Schuller. Schuller, in turn, inspired Hybels, Rick Warren, etc. Seems to work. Huge amounts of money. Television. Large amounts of books sold. And droves and droves of people. This church was made for California. They had a car park, hundreds of acres. You don't have them in this country because of the weather, but in America they have drive-in movie theaters, a big outdoor screen with a speaker, and you put it in your car and watch the movie from your car and eat popcorn. In addition to the church, there was people in the drive-in watching the the solar, and they got just like a drive-in, always packed out. Thought it was fantastic. What happens when this happens? Certain things always seem to come into play when you get heavy shepherding. I've seen it in small churches that do it. I've seen it in medium churches that do it. And I've seen it in big churches that do it. Eventually, one of two things happen. They outgrow themselves, go into a crisis and collapse. That's one route the whole thing eventually falls to pieces. Or, worse, they eventually turn into a cult. What's dangerous about these cults is this. They're not cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons or the R.A. Krishnas. When a Jehovah's Witness gets saved, they can reject all of it. When a Mormon gets saved, they can reject all of it. It was all lies. It was false. These groups are much more complicated. They use the true gospel in which people are actually born again many times to get them into the group. (laughs) Forgetting that Jesus said to make disciples, not converts. But their view of discipleship is not biblical discipleship. Biblical discipleship is where Paul said, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Paul never said be like Paul. Paul never established a personality cult. He never wanted people to be clones of himself. He said, you can be like me to the extent I'm being like Jesus. You can follow me to the extent I'm following Jesus. (laughs) He never said be like me. But when the leader becomes so identified in his own mind with Christ, he thinks he's the vicar of Christ, like the Pope. And if you speak against him, it's like speaking against Christ. I'm not talking about rebellion. I'm not talking about attacking somebody for upholding the word of God. I'm talking about when they don't uphold the word of God and you challenge them. But as far as they're concerned, you're a blasphemer and a rebel. Three things happen. One, whenever you have that kind of power, there's no real plurality of leadership. The pastor is not the first among equals, the primus inter paris. He's the autocrat. New Testament leadership is always based on a plurality. The pastor's the first among equals, but that's his position. 
He presides the way James did in Acts 15. But James was not the dictator. Well, let's understand this. The first thing that happens when sheep get abused this way is financial exploitation at some point takes place. The sheep get fleeced. Now they can always justify it by giving to God's work. They know how to dress it up and package it. Now notice this. If somebody is not willing to make tents, if somebody is not willing to have a secular job, to be a fisherman and do the work of the Lord part-time, they are unqualified to do it full-time. If you're not willing to do it without salary, don't expect a salary. If God blesses a church and it grows, he adds to the numbers, and they need somebody full-time, well, God guides, God provides. That is honorable. I began in the ministry in Israel for years. Yes, I filled prescriptions six days a week. I did evangelism and co-led a congregation in addition. For years, I supported my family and myself and helped support the congregation by working in a secular job. I didn't like it. It was 5% medicine and pharmacology, in which I did have an interest, and 95% filling out forms and telling old ladies in Yiddish how many to take because they couldn't speak Hebrew. I did not like it. It was boring. But it was the only thing I knew how to do. It was the only thing I studied in university. the only thing I knew how to do. I had a family. I needed a job. The Lord brought me to Israel. I didn't like it. But I did it. It's very easy for somebody who is paid for being in full-time ministry to stand up Sunday after Sunday and tell you how to be spiritual when he's getting paid for it. But when that guy has to go out and earn his living as a dentist or a plumber and then function in congregational leadership in addition, then he's earned the right to tell you how to be spiritual (laughs) because he's functioning in the real world. If he hasn't functioned in the real world, he shouldn't be in the pulpit. Now, if the church grows or God calls him to something like this, no problem. Workman deserves his wages. It is an injustice that so many honest ministers and honest missionaries I know are underpaid. People work very hard. And so many con artists who shouldn't be in the ministry are overpaid. Some of them don't work at all. But if somebody is not willing to earn their bread the way you earn yours, they shouldn't be in the ministry full time anyway. The first thing that happens is the sheep get fleeced. Just like in the book of Amos, remember? The bushel gets bigger, the bushel gets smaller, the shekel gets bigger. The more they talk about money, the less they expound the word of God. Look at the book of Amos. Chapter 8. Verse 5. When will the new moon be over that we may sell the grain? And the Sabbath that we may open the wheat market to make the bushel smaller and the shekel bigger. (laughs) The wheat market. For the record, those books and tapes you see back there, I promise you I do not take one penny in royalty. Legally, I am entitled to, but I do not believe the Lord wants me to. If somebody wants something and they can't afford it, we'll give it to them. We use the proceeds from what we sell to subsidize what we give away to poor people, to prison ministries, and to unsaved people. And if somebody wants something and they can't afford it, give us what you can. If you don't have the money, send it in when you get it, as long as we know you. It's not a wheat market. 
Freely you receive, freely give. We try to keep the prices as low as we can. When I see people selling these CDs for, <laughs> for <laughs> these prices, I can't believe some of it. What's going on here? What can go on here? The shekel gets bigger, and whenever the shekel gets bigger, the bushel gets smaller. The more they talk about money, the less they expound the word of God. The first thing that happens, the sheep get fleeced. Every week, they're on about money. Like the televangelists, every broadcast is about money. The New Testament says very little about money, and most of what it says is a warning. Let each give as he's purposed in his heart. That's the first thing that's going to happen. The sheep are going to get fleeced. Second thing that will happen with heavy shepherding, eventually. When you exercise that kind of ungodly influence and control over people, sooner or later, something of a sexually immoral nature is going to take place. You cannot have that kind of control over people that God never intended a leader to have and not misuse it. It will be used to fleece and it will be used to seduce. It becomes predatory. It becomes predatory. They become financial predators. They become sexual predators. Power. Paul talks about those who captivate women unaware and stuff like this. You get women with unsaved husbands and stuff like this, and he's such a spiritual man. And and he's got this kind of power. (laughs) I've seen it so many times. There's a lot of secret sexual stuff going on with these guys. We only see the tip of the iceberg. But sooner or later, something gives. And it's not all of a sudden. It's been going on for some time. You'd be better off going, you know, on a sex junket to Thailand or something than you would be using your position to prey on the Lord's sheep. (laughs) You're going to find sexually predatory, immoral behavior. That's the second thing you're going to see. But then the third thing you're going to see is this if it goes down the cult route. And I've seen many groups that have. Bill Gothard in America. It's cultic. Sooner or later, they are going to get into heresy. They're going to get into some very serious false doctrine. They're going to get a hold of something and distort it out of context and make a big fundamental doctrine out of some obscure thing usually and build a whole theology on it. And that's going to lead them into other error. It's dangerous. Those three things will happen. Fleecing of the sheep, sexual immorality, and heretical doctrine. That's if it goes that way. If it goes the other way, they tend to get themselves into an overambition driven by spiritual pride that they camouflage by calling it faith. They get bigger ideas of grandeur, not realizing they're being lured under the judgment of God. And the Lord just lets them do it, lets them do it, lets them do it, until the rope is around their neck. Then he lets them hang. The church without walls in America, Paula White, 13 million in debt, Bye-bye. Todd Bentley's church, the Lakeland in America, bye-bye. The world's first megachurch, Robert Schuller's Crystal Cathedral. 58 million in debt. The Roman Catholic Church bought it for a cheese sandwich and a bag of crisps. Why wouldn't they? First he had the Grand Mufti of Damascus, a Muslim, in his pulpit. Shula says he wouldn't mind if his grandchildren became Muslims. And he attacked Dave Hunt. (laughs) Then when the Pope came to Los Angeles, he said, we have to go to the Holy Father and ask him the way home. (laughs) 
Guess who the two biggest bidders on his building were? The Muslims and the Roman Catholic Church. The Archbishop of Orange County threw in a bag of crisps, so he got it. (laughs) If you don't know, many churches, particularly among my fellow Charismatics and Pentecostals, have gone to the wall this way. Remember that church in Leigh that took over the school? He had the Toronto, he had karate lessons, he had everything. What happened to that one? Bang. What happened to Benny Finch's church with the homes for the old people and stuff? Was that with witness? The place was built to hold like a thousand people or so, close to a thousand. Assemblies of God. Bang! <laughs> I see what was left of Ken Gott's church in Sunderland. <laughs> Bang! Sooner or later, God just leads them on. They talk about faith. They talk about blessing. They talk about God's given us a vision. No, they've had a hallucination. And it all goes. I've seen these pastors leave the country and go to America, leaving churches in debt, sometimes for over a million pounds. <laughs> Who's left with the bill? It's unbelievable. I've seen this happen not far from here. We know what happened to the Assemblies of God in Wigan. What happens when a church brings in round tables for the Sunday evening service and plays Frank Sinatra records to be seeker, seeker friendly? I did it my way. Do it your way. You're not doing it God's way. Sooner or later, usually sooner than later, the show is going to be over. I have been saying this for years. Once the curtain comes down and the show is over, people will go find the next freak show. What is left of Brownsville Assemblies of God in Pensacola, Florida? Nothing. What is left of Toronto Airport Vineyard? Practically nothing. When it's over, it's over. But a time is coming when we are going to see a series of major bankruptcies of major ministries and major churches. They talked about faith and vision. But it all comes down to the same thing. Unless the Lord builds a house, it cannot stand. The labors labor in vain. Now don't get me wrong. If God says get a building, get a building. If he says get a thousand buildings, get a thousand buildings. We needed a new facility in Africa for our kids. Jesus gave it to us. We need stuff in the Philippines. He gives it to us. He's rich. He's not broke. He's rich. He's not broke. But he's not stupid. He knows who he can trust and who he can't. When they get in trouble, the more they get in trouble, the more abusive and exploitative they become. (laughs) They preach even more about money the way Wendy and Rory Alec are doing now, the way the TBN guys are doing now that their families turned against them in America. They become more exploitative and they become more abusive. Sooner or later, even the dumbest of the sheep begin to wander off. They lose them. They go. And you wind up like... That place over in Witness. Just a big empty building. But there's more to come. They're feeding themselves. Not the flocks. They're clothing themselves. Now I'll tell you what bothers me. Knowing a lot of these guys personally. Not saying all of them. But probably most of them. You understand that very few of them could have had that kind of success 
had they not prostituted the Word of God. They are not clever enough to make that in a business or a trade or a profession. They are not that smart. Many of them are not even clever enough to have gone to a real seminary. Now, I'm not saying you have to have gone to a seminary to be in the ministry, but you have to know the Word of God. Many of these people couldn't be where they are had they not been in the assemblies of God or Elam or something like that. But once the show is over, now they have nowhere to go. But I don't care where they go. I care where the sheep go. I care about the people who leave these churches and who wander off. I care about people who were never taught the word of God. It may surprise you, but when you talk to many of these Christians, they don't know even basic doctrine. Some of them wouldn't even know how to explain the gospel correctly. And they'd been in these churches for years. Remember, we live in an age where what used to be anointing is now hype. What used to be worship is now entertainment. What used to be teaching is now motivational speaking. They just don't know. They don't know. And they don't even know they don't know. Now what happens when such sheep wander off? Ezekiel tells us. The beasts are waiting for them. The devils will get to them. Satan knows who they are. He knows where they are. If we don't get to them first, maybe a mosque will, or a kingdom hall will, or a Mormon will, or they'll go back to Rome, or they'll just go into the world. They will become prey for the beasts for lack of a shepherd. The Lord says, as a shepherd cares for his sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. Are there people here who used to be in dodgy churches and you got out of them? Put your hand up. Look around. How many of you wandered around and eventually found fellowship with other people who weren't crazy? Put your hand up. Why did that happen? Because the Lord gathers his sheep. He gathers his sheep. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for new folds. He's looking for new fellowships. He's looking for new meetings. He's looking for new shepherds. He's looking for new ones. These other ones, they're going to be in so much financial and legal trouble within the next five to ten years. Mark my words. They're going to be in such a hole legally and financially. Ministry will not be their priority. It already isn't. It's something else. They're just pretending it's ministry. These things are going to be run by accountants and bankruptcy lawyers. (laughs) Understand what these denominations have become. Let me tell you what most of the denominations now are. They are pension funds and property trusts. That's what they are. They're pension funds and property trusts. When you come to know their executives and their superintendents and see what they talk about at their meetings, what their priorities are, it's administrative. It's legal. It's financial. It's like any other business, only it's a property trust and a pension fund with the tax exemption. That's all it is. It's about increasingly disused properties and superannuation. (laughs) That's what it is. Where did Jesus say, I came to establish my pension fund? 
Where did Jesus say, upon this rock I will build my property trust, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it? When did he ever say that? He never said that. Well, let them have their pension fund. Let them have their property trust. Let them build their superannuation. Because the more they build it up, the faster it is going to crumble. The day is coming. Jesus, however, is building a church on a rock. He's the rock. That church doesn't crumble. It may or may not have a building. It may or may not have a full-time pastor. It may or may not be a UK registered charity. But it's not about that. It's about Jesus. And it's about his sheep. It's tragic that what happened in the last days of Israel and the last days of Judah, way back in the days of Ezekiel, is happening today to one denomination after another. And to make matters worse, I know individual Pentecostal ministers who are godly men and individual Baptist ministers who are godly men. Next week I'll be at a Methodist church with a minister who is a godly man. And they're being persecuted by the other ones. What do they threaten them with? If you don't tow the party line, we'll take your building. That's what they do. You'll lose your credentials. You'll lose your pension. You can take the building. God's got lots of buildings if he wants me to have one. Pension, well, my father's rich. I don't worry too much about that. Credentials? <laughs> I don't want yours anyway. <laughs> you can have all that stuff, but you're not taking the sheep. That, that is a shepherd who is after God's own heart. That is the man God will bless. That is the man God will use. We are going to see more and more of this in the next several years. When it happens, I'm not asking you to remember that you heard it here first. You didn't hear it here first. You didn't hear it from Jacob Rash. You heard it from the book of Ezekiel. It is not just a book about the past. It is a book about the future. And it's a book about the present. You want to know what's going to happen? That's easy. Look at what did happen. You want to understand prophecy? Begin by understanding history. What is going to take place? That which has already taken place. The sheep are being scattered. The beasts are devouring them. But despite this, I assure you, as he has done for us, he is perfectly capable of doing for others. In these last days, the Lord will gather his sheep. God bless. It may be a month when the day is awaking and sunlight through darkness and shadow is breaking that Jesus will come in the fullness of glory to receive from the world his own.
spoke to Moses saying speak to Aaron and to his son saying thus you shall bless the sons of Israel and say to them the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace so they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel and then I will bless them Shalom.